great. I'm now calling the Tuesday, June 18th, 2024, regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. The time is 7.09 p.m. Please note we're conducting a hybrid meeting, which allows staff and members of the public to attend this meeting via virtual teleconference. The hybrid meeting will be video recorded and posted on the district's website. Because we are video conferencing, we will follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. If you've called into this meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video conferencing etiquette by muting your line when you're not speaking and limiting distractive behavior on camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call. Okay, commissioners, I will be conducting all roll calls this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comment or vote. President Spreen? Here. Vice President Sherlock? Here. Commissioner Basigi? Commissioner McDonald? Here. Commissioner Tonka? Here. Commissioner Tyson? Here. Commissioner Warren? Here. Okay. We have six commissioners present. And for the benefit of the recording, I will also conduct a presenter's consultants and staff roll call. Santa Clara County Fire Department Fire Chief Kurt Kyle. Present. Good evening. Okay. Um, Santa Clara County Fire Department Director of Support Services Snow. I believe I saw him. Present. I'm here. Oh, there he is. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, Santa Clara County Fire Department Senior Hazardous Materials Specialist Ruel is in the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jackson's Drones Videographer Consultant Ricketts is here. Uh, Municipal Resource Group Strategic Planning Consultant Scott is over there. Community Education Risk Reduction Manager Gluhan is there. Present. Okay. Emergency Services Manager BB. Present. Programs Planning Grants Manager Woods is Send in the back. Yeah. Uh, technical Analyst Project Manager Cronin. Present. Here. Thank you. Uh, General Analyst Georgie. Present. Okay. Community Events Specialist Satchdeva. Here. Okay. Uh, Project Specialist BB is in the audience. Uh, Finance Manager Morialli. Present. General Manager Logan. Present. Deputy County Counsel Forbat. Present. Okay, presenters, consultants, and staff are accounted for. Thank you very much. Let's see. We'll move on to item two, uh, Commission President Remarks. Uh, again, thank you everyone for being here and apologize for the late start following our closed session. So we will move right ahead. Uh, first, I would like to announce that as a courtesy, any members of the public having objections to the proposed abatement of hazardous weed brush and or rubbish on their property are being given the opportunity to discuss their situation with Santa Clara County Fire Department Senior Hazardous Materials Specialist, Curtis Rule, I hope that's the right way to pronounce it, in a separate breakout room back there before providing public testimony under agenda item six. Are there any members of the public present who would like to speak privately uh, before providing comment during the public hearing? Yes, please. Okay, yes, we have um, Mia Bossi is uh, on the call. Um, so Mia, we will have um, one of our staff put you into a breakout room in the back so that you can speak privately with Mr. Ruel. Thank you. Mm -hmm, sir. Excellent, great. Anybody else that we need to make sure is properly uh, forwarded to the right place? Great, and we appreciate uh, all this going on beforehand so that when we get to that item, hopefully everything gets taken care of. Moving on to item three, public comment. Persons wishing to address the commission on any subject not on the agenda tonight may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker unless the number of speakers requires uh, the commission president to impose shorter time limits. Do we have any public comment on items not on the agenda? I am not seeing any public comment. Great. Well, in that case, thank you, everyone. We'll move on to item four, agenda amendments and changes. Are there any comments from staff on the item in terms of agenda changes or amendments? Seeing none, would the commissioners like to make changes to the order of agenda in any way? I think it's okay. I think we're good there too. Great. Um, since there are no proposed changes, we'll move on to item five, which is the consent calendar. Um, let's see. 
Moving on to item five. Any any comments from staff on the consent items? Any questions from the commission on the consent items? But not a question, but just a comment. I, I appreciated the um, the level of detail and the quality of the slides that went into consent, so that we have the opportunity to review that on our own, raise a question if we have any, but still absorb the information and shorten the meeting. Great, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate staff really really moving. That they took that at heart and uh, it's really made the meetings move well. Thank you. Yes, second that. Any other comments? Seeing none. Okay. I'll now entertain a motion. Will the commissioner make? Dr. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <like> seconds. <laughs> okay, great. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any public comment on the consent calendar items? I am not seeing any. Great. In that case, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please connect the roll call. Okay. President Spreen. Yes. Vice President Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. And the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Okay, we'll now move on to item six, the public hearing. Item six A is a public hearing to consider abatement of hazardous weed, brush, and or rubbish growing on certain described properties within the wildland urban interface, wooey, and declared to be a public nuisance. Um, I think we have a slide here uh, just to sort of remind everyone what this is all about, which was uh, put together by our staff uh, several months ago, as you all remember, but I think it's worth pointing out where we are. Also gives more time to... Perfect. Great. And this is the, the uh, uh, very busy calendar because we have a very busy year. To remind everyone, we are now down in the lower right-hand corner where it says that the uh, Santa Clara County weed abatement authorized by resolution to abate hazards. You notice we actually, oh, I should read this. Uh, you notice we actually have two periods every year where we do this action, same as up in January. This hearing is different from that similar public hearing which was held in January, and that the properties on this list are based on the county WUI enforced safety regulations with inspections prov provided by the Santa Clara County Fire Department Fire Prevention Division. The properties on the list from January's public hearing are based on the Town of Los Altos Hills Enforced Municipal Code with inspection provided by the County of Santa Clara Weed Abatement Program. Um, so that's the difference there. And you'll notice that uh, the other thing we'll be doing uh, is the item, which is now covered over by <laughs> cursor item. Uh, we will, in addition to authorizing the weed abatement, uh, July, no, thank you, in July, there's the once a year duty of authorizing the liens for the cost of that. Tonight, we will also be addressing that by essentially authorizing the July action. But uh, the key now is the abatement item. Uh, let's see. Uh, I wonder if Santa Clara County Fire Department Senior Hazardous Materials Specialist Curtis Rule would like to provide the commission and public with a brief overview of this process. number of mailings and inspections. In February, we do an initial mailing to all residents of our property requirements, clearance requirements, and just a, an overview. Uh, March through April, we're conducting initial inspections, which will include door hanger notifications for property owners who have compliance issues that need to be corrected. In addition to that door hanger, we then provide a mailer within one business day after the inspection that goes to the property owner of record to give them additional formal notification for violations. Around mid-May, we'll do a second inspection to confirm whether the violation has been cleared or not. Then approximately through the end of May to around the end of the first week of June, we public hearing notices for properties that are still not in compliance. And up to June 13th, we're still conducting additional inspections to clear properties as well off the list and we'll have some tonight that I will be reading to the record if the time is appropriate. And then we have tonight's public hearing, which obviously you're a part of, and ongoing throughout the whole process, we're available by phone and the internet. And we additionally provided on May 8th a community wildfire preparedness workshop 
for the residents that live in the area. So I think that provides a good overview, arcing summary of our program. We're, we're continually in contact with the residents and provide, I think, a very high quality of service. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Any questions, comments here? Any, okay. Any public Just questions? Question. Oh, uh, how many properties are in violation as of now? Mm. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. I will now open the public hearing. The time is 7.19 p.m. Please note if any members of the public would like to contest the inclusion of their name or parcel number in Exhibit A of Resolution Number 24-05 of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to proceed with the abatement of weeds, that's tonight's list, or the abatement of weeds, brush, and or rubbish, now is the time to do so. Any and all persons interested in having any objections to the list or to any matter contained therein may appear and be heard. Are there any comments from the public? Um, yes, looks like we have one public comment in house. Mm -hmm. And before he starts, are there any online who are looking to speak? Um, there is one hand raised online as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, my name is Robert Schwalzman. Any comments or questions? Please. So you said that the work's going to be done this Saturday? Yes. It's going to be done this Saturday. Great. Thank you. And uh, what's your understanding of, of the of the work that's supposed to be done? You mentioned that it's not very clear, but what's your understanding of what you need to get done? Question for our staff is, are, I assume that the rules that they're trying to get him to are the same as what we do during our evacuation route clearing? Because it sounds like 13 foot high, cleaning's up. 
Um, I'm wondering what kind of after support this these residents will get who seem to be fairly uh, sincere about trying to get things done. Can, uh, can we get, I'm wondering how we can do this and get them the help they need and not I mean, add them to the, the, the resident area. They're going to do it on Saturday. Yeah. And I'm inclined to, you know, and all he's here in good faith, to, yeah. you know, and they're going to get it done. So I'm, I'm inclined to say we should pull these. Four I agree. Resident. The idea is not to be punitive. You know, the yeah. idea is, you know, to make sure we help out somebody who makes a good faith effort to make this happen. And if we can provide you the support that you need in order to get it done, I think that's what we need to do. Right. So if somebody can staff from staff can connect with him and maybe walk the property and tell him exactly what needs to be done and follow up with the email. Then they'll have something documented, which they can check off. Great. Any other questions for the? Right. Oh, please. I'll share that the the two requirements for properties are defensible space, and then with certain properties within the WUI of depending upon their size have county weed abatement requirements as well. The defensible space requirements are put out by the state. They're adopted by the town. Um, they are published by the state. They're published by the town, and they're published by your fire district. So if you will visit our district website, uh, the requirements of 30 feet around your property, um, clearing out underneath any overhanging decks, clearance from chimneys, um, propane storage, firewood storage, um, spark arresters, all of that information is available as to what needs to be done at the property. The weed abatement program which specifies the 10 feet along access roads for fire engines. So that would include a driveway, a private road, a public road. And yes, that is a very close to what we do with our evacuation routes. Um, we get into easements and the ability to do that. There is a vertical spacing also that, that incorporates the height of a fire engine. So we're looking for a, a 13 feet over roadways. Um, the 10 feet is the separation of low hanging limbs to vegetation. But there's a caveat that the tr that it can't be more than a third of the height of the tree because that would damage the the, the plant. Um, so all of that information, if you will, I'll be happy to work, walk through you walk through it with you, uh, is available on our website, and I can answer any questions for it you with that. Okay. Different information from the inspectors that different members. Okay. Yeah, it it's extensive, and uh, uh, but it is documented in state code, and I'll we'll have a great session. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, it's not easy even for an expert. So thank you. A question: Are uh, is it every every parcel along this private road been flagged, or is it just your parcels on the road? Parcel. I see. So you're in a way representing the different the other owners of the road. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. So how do we go about getting the four off the list? Well, we can do. Well, we can at the time of motion, we All can right. ask to have that to not approve on the list. All right. Okay. Any other All comments, right. questions? And we do have another public comment. I mean, just make sure any more comments, questions on this oh, particular. I'm sorry. <laughs> great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, yes. Next. Next. Um. Yeah. So we have a, a um, public comment from Alan Epstein. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually have an, a number of comments on this matter. First, I'd like to mention that this resolution number 24-05 talks about weed, brush, or other rubbish. It does not talk about um, what was described by the fire um, technician. Uh, so I, I interpret this to be just what's required under the uh, the program by the county, which is the weed and brush um, requirements, and not the not the requirement under the state code. My second question is: is there's only 14 streets listed on this list? There are, you know, there are, I don't know, 4,000 properties in the district. I'm curious as to how many properties were actually inspected, um, how many properties fall within the WUI. Uh, we have a very large fire district staff. Uh, I'm curious as to who did the inspections and uh, what part of the district uh, was inspected. Fire safety is very important to all of us. And um, 
this list just doesn't seem to me to be comparable to the list that we've seen in the past. Maybe that's wonderful. Maybe everybody has done what they've required to do, but um, I wonder whether the list is short because few inspections were performed this year. So I'd be very curious to learn about the process that was involved and my question about what the resolution requires. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that goes into some, some of the, the meta comments of how this process was done right now. Tonight, we're more interested in making sure that the residents who are on the list are taken care of. So I think we'll stay focused on that. Uh, are there any more public uh, comments? I see one here. You're welcome to come up to the mic. I have two driveways, one going down to the steep hill that there's no fire truck on this planet that's going to go down that road. But I clear a 13 and a half feet over the top of it because of how vague the ledges and the notices have been of what I needed to do. It would have been nice to keep the shade and the street was intact, but you can't do it anyway. So there's nothing to know with the statement on the top driveway, which is drivable, but it's like one max. Any comments, questions? Great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Any other public comments? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Rule, I guess I'm offer you a chance to offer any changes to the resolution before we close it and, and form it for...
uh, did that include the two item two gentlemen that spoke here? No, I didn't hear the lone lone oak. Okay. okay. And did we sir yours on La Crest? Was that included? Um, right. I wanted to <clears throat> I see. Okay. Um, okay. Any comments for commissioner here? Is this when we can propose removing? Well, first, let, first, I'm going to close the public hearing. Okay. Uh, the time being 7:34, since we have no more public comments on it. Um, and let's see, item. Let's see. So 6B is the resolution to proceed the abatement of weeds. Um, and now we can offer questions or comments or changes. Um, I would say that we want to offer, we can entertain a motion with amendments to the, both including his changes and any changes we wish to propose. I propose an amend, uh, a, a motion to adopt six, um, um, 2405 with amendments. Mm -hmm. And those amendments being the proposal, um, um, the changes already uh, read into record, uh, plus the additional gentleman's property on La Cresta and the four on Lone Oak. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a second to that? I... Tyson seconds. Okay, and now the item's open for discussion. Any discussion from the commission? I, I just had a, a question, a clarification. Do you, have, do you have a mic to talk to? Yeah. Yes, I just had a question for clarification. The gentleman asked about... Um, the inspections and how many we do, and I believe is it a third a year approximately of the properties that are inspected? I don't I don't believe it's a hundred percent each year. It's definitely not, but I um I don't know if we have an answer to that. I wouldn't necessarily if you have any comments on that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on the motion that's been seconded? Oh, um, yeah. Just um, for the record, could I get again the the two addresses um, for the members of the public that are here that we're removing? Well, I know that one's going to have several addresses on it because it's the, the neighborhood. Oh, it's, it's eighteen, nineteen, twenty-one, and twenty-two. That's the easiest number to look at. Eighteen, nineteen. Low note. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, but the, the what's the one for La Cresta, which is thirteen. Uh, uh, number nine. Number nine. Thirteen zero three four Lacrosta. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other comments on that particular motion? Seeing none. Any public comments on this motion? Uh, oops. Sorry. <laughs> when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see. No, there is no public comment. <laughs> Great. Um, in that case, uh, we'll now vote. District of Vargas, please conduct the roll call. All right. President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. And Commissioner Warren? Yes. Okay. And the motion passes six to zero with one absent. And the list that is currently on display, those name numbers that are highlighted are the ones that are being removed from the list. Um, thank you. Well, I'm, I thank staff for their involvement here. And I'm assuming we can sort of maybe follow up with these properties to make sure that action really gets done because I think that uh, uh, we love seeing action get done <laughs> and we have a lot of experience at that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen, for showing up and uh, we appreciate your efforts and uh, th the town appreciates your efforts. Okay, great. Moving on to item seven, adoption of resolution 2406. Um, this is for setting a public hearing at the July 16th regular commission meeting for objections to the proposed special assessment cost associated with the abatement of weeds or brush growing and or rubbish contained on certain described properties. And that's a mouthful. Please note the WUI enforced properties attached to resolution 24-05 in agenda item six are not included on this list due to the property tax assessor office submission deadline. Um, if applicable, special assessment costs relating to inspections and abatements on the properties attached to 2405 will be included on the special assessment list provided next year in June 2025. <laughs> just to make things confusing. Are there any clarifying questions from the commission? Great. Um, I'll now entertain a motion. Warren moves. Tonka seconds. Thank you. Uh, now open for discussion. Any discussion on that? I wouldn't expect any. Any public comments on this? I would assume not. Nope, Thank I'm you. I'm not seeing any. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, let's now vote. Please conduct a roll call. 
Okay. President Spreen. Yes. Vice President Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. All right. And the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Thank you very much. And again, thank everyone for uh, both, both of the county and with the, the, the public for uh, being involved in this process. Um, moving on to item eight, which is the uh, Integrated Hazardous Fuel Reduction Technology Report. Programs Planning and Grants Manager Woods and Jackson Drones Videographer and Consultant Ricketts will please provide us a presentation. Hang on. inform uh, data helps inform the project scope the maintenance cycle documentation and effectiveness of the program um, a little bit into the technology side we utilize photogrammetry which is taking a bunch of aerial photographs putting them together to create 2d and 3d data products um, we also utilize spectral imaging as well as lidar data next slide please um, so this is a little bit of the process that we go through to um, essentially allow us to deliver the data and the reports. Um, number one, we start with image capture. Um, and so we fly over the evacuation routes within the right of way. Um, we take the, the mapping and the spectral data and we go ahead and process that, um, which then allows us to identify and classify the hazardous vegetation along the um, evacuation route or uh, fuel breaks. We then take that data, we go ahead and analyze it. Um, and this is where we're uh, analyzing volume, uh, acreage, um, uh, how much vegetation has grown back or how much vegetation has uh, decreased. And then we go ahead and deliver this in a PDF report. Um, we basically do this three times. So essentially we do this before an evacuation starts to deliver um, basically a route profile and analytics around an evacuation route to give staff the appropriate information they need to go ahead and make the decisions for that particular route. Um, we do this uh, before and after the project, so we can analyze the amount of vegetation that was removed in cubic vol or cubic uh, uh, cubic yards, so volume and ac uh, acreage, um, so the decrease of vegetation, so what was our impact, um, and then we go ahead and take this information a year after um, we fly another route or fly the same route again, um, and we go ahead and basically track how much vegetation has grown, and so uh, we can go ahead and push resources um, to appropriate areas. Next slide. Okay. So the things that we look at when we do the flyovers, and this is an example of one of the report images that comes back to us, is the heights of the vegetation. We use three categories. High is your tree canopies, it's above five meters. Medium is your brush and shrubs. This is where a lot of your ornamentals fall. Um, and then low is the grasses, that's the flashy fuels. So you can see on the image, the bright green is the high, so that's the tops of the trees. And then we have medium and low areas. And you can also see the kind of pale green is the public like Google Maps, if you will, so that we're only collecting the data right above the um, evacuation route. So we're not um, up in the top of the picture. There's the edge of someone's house, so we don't have concerns about flying over things like that. We're just flying over the public right away. The other thing that we're able to track is invasive species and pathogens. The um, Some of the uh, 
UAS equipment that's used can tell the difference between the species based on their infrared signatures. So, and then the next thing we have coming up is the ability to look at vegetation moisture content. You can imagine the last two years, things are pretty wet and it's been fine. And now we have things drying out, a lot of flashy fuels. So we'll be able to do a better job at predicting what's gonna dry out. And if you think about the winters before 2021, we had multiple years of drought in a row. Of course, it contributed to the CZU fire, which was right on our Western edge there. So that's a new upcoming um, tracking statistic that we wanna keep an eye on. Next slide. Sorry, we're doing a little juggling here. This one's also me. So this is an example of the advanced report, which is in advance of the project. So this is a result of a before flyover. So we have the flight itself, and then we have the reports that come in. So the IHFR team uses this report to clarify the scope of work before it's sent out to Fire Safe Council, project managers, um, contractors that come in and do the work. It includes things like the slope because you can only work on certain slopes and get in on certain slopes with the chipping materials and the hand crews from the contractors. We also identify the infrastructure for safety. So we're looking for utility lines, power poles, that kind of thing. Fire hydrants are important because we want to make sure we uncover them. They've got that three foot town ordinance that we wanna make sure they're cleared for. And there's our vegetation profile again that we covered in the last slide. And these are the things that it impacts. It changes our field production day estimates. Um, we're working really hard to narrow down accurate field production days. It affects the quotes and it affects the contractor participation. So if we estimate eight days and it's only four days worth of work, they're not really crazy about that and they may not bid on our next one. So this ups our um, accuracy in predicting the production days. Um, for all the contractors, traffic control, project staff, things like that. And those are the three, the last bullet point is the three things that we've, you've heard me talk about before. Those are the three main things we look for in the before flyovers when we're adjusting the scope of work. So in this picture, you can see we've got a couple power poles. We've got some lines and wires. There's our vegetation heights again. So we know what we're gonna be concentrating on if we have a lot of fasci fuels if we have a lot of bushes that need to be chipped and taken out. And then the 50 foot buffer with the dark blue lines, that's the widest that we would go. The 50 foot buffer sometimes goes into people's front yards. So we always have about 10 to 15 feet as the public right of way in our, permit, in our permits, but we file our CEQA documents to go up to 50 feet if the residents wanna sign an ROE and participate. So that's the widest that the project could be. Next slide. I think that's cute. Cool. So this is one of our volumetric reports. And the way we do this is we do a before flyover and an after flyover. And the data products that we produce are two-dimensional and three-dimensional. So we can extract things like surface area um, as well as volume. And so on the right, we see a page from the report. And I believe this is the Arastadera report, where we're comparing November to uh, December. And so this would be the impact of our project. And so in this case, we've seen a 0.35% decrease in low vegetation, a 10% decrease in medium vegetation, and a 5% decrease in uh, high vegetation. Um, that was a baseline. And then the other thing, what's nice about these is once we have that snapshot in time, we can then uh, go ahead and refer to that snapshot to see year after year how much vegetation has actually grown back. Question for you? If it, can we can we interrupt by the way and, and ask questions? Sure. With the high vegetation, which are big trees, I mean those. The work we're doing isn't really cut, cutting the tops of the trees. Doesn't that tend to disguise work underneath it? So with photogrammetry, we really only can measure what we can see. Mm -hmm. But when we start limbing up the sides of the trees, we're actually decreasing some of the volume and the surface area on top as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're in, next slide. And is this me as well? I think it is me. Um, so like I was saying before, um, we can take that snapshot in time and go ahead and compare this to a year later. 
Um, and so with this report, we go ahead and do a flyover one year after uh, the evacuation route was um, was conducted or the vegetation management project was conducted. And we can uh, quantitatively show the metrics around how much vegetation has grown in that year. Um, and so in this case, we have a 300, 400% increase of low, 22% increase in medium and 37% increase in high. And this allows us to really track the growth of these evacuation routes and also potentially help us um, uh, do the project planning and implement resources where um, resources are needed. I'll just chime in here. This is one of the things that you've heard about in the work plan. Can we go back again, Corey? It, yeah, it's okay. Sorry. In the work plan where we talk about tradition using the you know best practices of a two-year maintenance cycle, but we may need to adjust based on um, wet years. So we discovered here, like especially for page mill, we have a lot of regrowth, even though we just did it May of 2023. So the maintenance flyover documentation has been super important and it'll directly impact as we, how we start planning the maintenance um, cycles that we've you know, presented a couple times, including in March when we came back from the district organizational meeting and showed you that graph where the overlap of the maintenance projects will eventually outpace the initial treatment projects. This is a key metric and report for that planning in our work plan. Okay, now next slide. <laughs> oh, I gave you some of this already. <laughs> yeah, so here's where, actually this one's yours too. <laughs> okay, um, so in this case, what we've done is we've broken down um, the vegetation by class uh, to identify what increase, so what's going on and how do we compare that data from this year to last year. Um, and so, like we said, uh, well, in this case, I think we're comparing June 2022 to May 2024, um, and we've broken down by vegetation class and be able to analyze and quantify how much vegetation has grown back um, by the particular class. Um, we're not very color specific species. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. And so I think this is this is kind of a telling example, and this is an example of burn preserve, where we use the goats for um, a fuel break. On the left is uh, basically a handheld map that the district has given, saying where the goats are going to be, um, and where the vegetation approximately is going to be um, eaten up by the goats. Or on the right is we've basically done a map of or a, a mineral system map of the area. Um, so on the top you see RGB, which is your visual visual spectrum, and on the bottom you have your spectral. And so with those two data sets, we can quantitatively measure and track the the actual impact the goats have um, on uh, on creating this fuel break. Correct. So the so if you look at the uh, photo on the right and the spectral photo, which is a green NDVI, um, what we're seeing is that brown uh, towards the uh, basically the brown is where the goats have treated, and so we can visually see and we can visually measure um, the actual impact that they have through the spectral imaging. This helps us with ground truthing too, so we know the contractors volume reported and the things that we're being invoiced for, we've got a, another way to document that biomass and that volume. Next slide. And here's another telling um, telling example. So we're looking at as RGB, so visual imagery. Um, on the left, you have burn preserve before. This, this was this year, 2024. And on the right, you have the after. And just from the visual images, so that we're not extracting volume, but we're not talking about area. We can just visually see what sort of impact the goats have had um, on burn preserve. Okay, next slide. Ooh, this is one of my new favorite topics. Um, so what we're looking at here is a LIDAR cross-section. And LIDAR, um, we've probably seen this on autonomous cars. Um, they're also on unmanned aerial systems. Is uh, LIDAR is a light detection and ranging, so a very accurate laser scanner. And one of the um, benefits of using LIDAR is being able to penetrate the tree canopy, unlike what we do with photogrammetry, and be able to see the ladder fuels or the ground. Um, and what we're seeing here is a cross section. So if we drew a just a uh, basically a line of, uh, across a 3D model, we're looking at, at it from the side. Um, this is actually my girlfriend's father's house. So on the top, you have a structure. 
And then um, we can eat, we can see the trees next to the structure and the trees have been limbed up, park-like treatment. And then if we move over to the right, we see how dense the ladder fuels are. And so it's not a new technology, um, but it is getting cheaper and, and a little bit easier to use. And so this is one way, this is one of the technologies that we do utilize. Great, and the last slide, please. So this should look a little familiar. Um, these are the things that are coming up in the future, as well as a summary of what we're using the technology for. And you can see the increase in the amount of activity with our before, after, and the maintenance flyovers actually aren't on here. So we've gone up to six evacuation route projects for 2024, and the circles represent the before and after flights. So we're getting um, a lot of data and we're also getting a lot, starting to get overlap and the other types of things that help us keep it all together. And then every one of these will appear next year as a maintenance flyover as we introduce next year, 2025, three or four initial treatments as well as our maintenance treatments. The other wonderful things that happen are um, JAXA develops algorithms for the specificity just for the district. So in the two years that he and I have been working together to narrow this down, he's actually been building what it measures in the background. So I've picked out the species, the invasive species that I want to know are coming back to our, you know, pro, our, our routes. We've picked out the, the types of things that are being introduced, like the shot hole borer beetle just came to this county earlier this year. So when we can track those types of things now based on the, the learning that's gone back and forth between what I need, what the district needs, and what Jackson's been able to create specifically for us. And then finally, the ground truth thing has been very important. It helps us, it, it's a two-way street. We get to verify what the contractors are telling us and they get to verify what Jackson's um, algorithms are measuring for us. So that's been excellent um, for the program. And we're also creating a database. You know, we're now in our third year of these projects. So we know what's been happening. We know what's been growing back. We know which levels of fuels are growing back. And we know we're starting to shift towards higher percentages in the canopy. So if you think about the vegetation we do want to retain, we want to retain the canopy. That's that shaded fuel break effect that we're going for. So this helps us show what we're doing and that we're doing it right. And also find out what is getting you know, down there and growing back as we change the sunlight that hits the ground and things like that. So um, exciting summary of what we have been doing and what's coming up. Thank you. Any comments, questions? It's just impressive that, you know, how you're using technology to s solve all these issues and uh, how targeted all of this is. It was a question. This seems very innovative. Is anyone else doing this in this area, or how unique are we in taking this approach to measurement and analysis? Well, Jackson and I and the IHFR team, we get to be the dream team. So mm -hmm. well, there's people who have come and asked us, Midpin and actually County Fire, and other folks who have asked about how we do and what we're doing. Um, drones are fairly new with some of this measurement. But um, the principles of what we're measuring and what we're looking for in the ground truth thing we're doing, that's across a lot of agencies that do this. Mm -hmm. The thing that stands out about this is, so the county, we buy, our, we buy services from the county for their LIDAR. You may have, I think we just approved it at the last mm -hmm. meeting, the renewal of that. They fly their LIDAR every three years. We're flying at every project so that we can get to those ladder fuels and those flashy fuels. Um, Cal Fire measures vegetation moisture. They measure in the month um, from like October to March. We're going to be able to look at that every time we fly over so that we can keep track of what our potentials are and what's coming up. So a lot of it has to do with our frequency and our specificity mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the district being able to have this resource. And one other question for Jackson, how automated is the analysis software? How much do you have to, time do you have to spend with the data, is, is it programmatic? Is it uh, manual? It's about, about 80-20. So the algorithms get us about 80 to 90% of the way there. And then mm -hmm. there's a human in the loop, which goes ahead and corrects some of the data mm -hmm. um, to make sure that our numbers are accurate. Okay, great. Any questions or comments? I see. 
Well, I was really looking forward to this presentation. Uh, I, it, the fact that you had the ground penetration, you had the uh, what you said also about, I guess, moisture content measurement in the future. I just see so much potential for this and the, to automate and, and track in real time. I, I see it so powerful. So you did not disappoint. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or comments here? Any public comments on this? Um, there is. I just wanted to, for the record, um, state, because I missed it during roll call, that um, we do have representatives from Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council here, um, Seth Chalet, Amanda Brenner Cannon, and Saeed Ortiz. And Amanda left a comment that says this is great. So <laughs> I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate just that. Just going back to how specific. So, you know, there are a lot of organizations that do mapping of this nature, but nothing to the fine scale that we're achieving. Okay. Um, you know, so each evacuation route probably generates a terabyte worth of data, vegetation wow. data. And so, it, you know, the, and, and we can, you can do some similar, similar things with satellite and, and manned aircraft. Um, but when it comes to really kind of getting the fine detail around the vegetation volume is we do need the unmanned aerial systems and the sensors that come along with that. So. Great. Thank you very much. Very interesting stuff. I'd like to make a comment if I could. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm just very excited, and I'm pleased to see that the commission is similarly excited by the presentation and just the notable and remarkableness of it. And I will say that as a fire district, our mission and our statement is to keep bad things from happening. And so in doing, sometimes I think we can go overboard in removing vegetation, removing brush, and this is a wonderful way of making sure that the earth is preserved. We understand our ecosystems and we are able to, to scientifically apply not only fire science, but also environmental protection and environmental science. And I think that's a very important, strong value that this district brings to the community and to other partner agencies that, that are vis, uh, vis, visualizing it and, and visiting our, our uh, endeavors. So I, I just applaud Jackson and uh, Eugenia and the whole team for uh, being so enlightened to do this. And thank you for doing that for us. I think we're, we're an innovative valley and I, I love that we're being innovative in this science as well. Thank you. All right. Let's see, um, moving on, we're moving on to item nine, which is the fire chief report. Uh, fire chief uh, Kerkao is going to provide us a report. Uh, good, uh, good evening, President Spring, commissioners. I apologize, I'm a little under the weather today, so I'll be uh, <clears throat> pretty brief. Um, the report uh, this month, um, as you see, page one, there was a structure fire. Um, it was basically a room and contents fire that was in uh, uh, the content loss uh, that is reported in the report. Um, again, for uh, a lot of the uh, structure fires that we respond to, we do it based on risk, which means we send a full complement that includes assets, not just from the Los Altos Hills Fire Department, but uh, Los Altos and then Mont uh, Monta Vista and neighboring Cupertino Station. Um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> a little bit busier uh, this last month in May, um, but that's not unusual, but nothing uh, really earth shattering. Again, you'll see that there were three fires last month. Um, two of them were, well, all of them were uh, structure fire based. One was a uh, pot on the stove. Uh, the other one was the room and contents. Um, and then uh, a barbecue fire that did not end up <laughs> resulting in any damage. Um, uh, you've got Send Me One who, that I believe uh, responded in from Cupertino on a rural density fire. That's the only really unusual uh, first do engine that you see in the lower left hand table there. And uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, again, distribution of calls uh, where they land. Red is a fire response. Red is not always what it, it's not always what it ends up being, but it's what we end up responding to uh, in terms of the reporting party. Um, and then I do want to make a comment uh, again that um, everything I'm seeing and hearing is uh, really tied together with this fire season. Um, everybody uh, probably is turning on the news and seeing wildfires that just sprouted up uh, over the weekend. Um, we had a few prior to that. Uh, Santa Clara County uh, 2310 Charlie, that's our type three strike team, is deployed down to um, the point fire down in Los Angeles County. Um, and that includes engine 374 from El Monte Station. So the crew 
that was on duty on Father's Day, all of those crews took off right away to go help those neighbors down there that were in need. We also worked through other resource requests. Um, and then additionally, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be brief here. Um, additionally, we've got um, uh, some uh, press releases that we have pushed out because we have had a rash of vegetation fires, all kept small, all because of just risk-based dispatching. So the work that uh, the residents do to uh, for clearance of their homes, the work that you're doing um, both with thinning of vegetation, again, being mindful of environmental impact, the work that the commissioners support um, and the work that County Fire does both on the prevention side as well as the response side, all just ties together to be, make uh, the, the community strong. And I just appreciate the opportunity to um, provide service to the hills and then be available for any question. End of report. Great, thank you. Any, any questions, comments? Seeing none from the commission, any public comments or questions? I don't see any. Great. Well, thank you very much and appreciate your, uh, hope your voice. Can hope you get better because uh, we can hear it in your voice for sure. Okay. Let's thank see. You. Moving, on to, <laughs> moving on to item 10 which is item 10A is a report on the fiscal year 25 budget, which will be followed by item 10B to adopt the district's fiscal year 25 budget and 10C to approve the district budget narrative. Finance Manager Morelli, if you would please provide this wonderful report. Okay, President Spring, Vice President Sherlock, members of the commission, I'm very pleased to present the budget this evening as well. And I'm just waiting for the slide to appear and we'll get started. Yeah, I apologize. Give me a second. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Disappeared. <laughs> okay, okay. And we can go to slide two, Corey. Thank you so much. So the purpose of tonight's um, uh, presentation is really just to receive an update on the budget. In fact, uh, we believe we have some very good news to deliver this, this evening. And we're asking the commission to adopt the budget as well uh, for fiscal year 24-25 and approve the budget narrative, which is attached also. Uh, next slide, please. The budget has been a long process. It started back in September, actually. We've gone through a series of three formal public meetings, uh, and we've had uh, uh, meetings with the county, in particular budget workshops in May and the budget uh, hearings in June, and our particular uh, me, uh, district was discussed on May 15th with the county and on June 11th uh, with the county as well. And in fact, um, we have this meeting here this evening, and the, commission, the county also had a meeting today, also kind of rounding out uh, final tidbits of, of budget adjustments, uh, actually uh, started at 1 o'clock, and I believe their meeting ended around 4 o'clock or so. So this has been a long process, uh, many people to thank, which I'll get to at the end of the presentation, uh, but I'm glad we're here and we've arrived uh, for the last bit of the calendar, which is the adoption this particular evening. Next slide, please. So I'm happy to announce that the county uh, has adopted and approved the budget in full as presented by the uh, commission. Uh, the budget was uh, uh, approved and adopted without exception. Uh, including every request that the commission had put forward for consideration. Uh, and that includes $18.5 million, $18.587 million in expenditures and revenues of 16.453. So um, that was uh, actually happened on June 13th. The county made that uh, adoption and um, we were present. Uh, General Manager Deloge and I were present at the particular session and we heard that, uh, that uh, approval. So uh, congratulations to this commission and, um, uh, and to the staff, uh, Corey for all our heavy lifting, uh, Jay for your leadership as well. And count, the county was remarkable in terms of their um, coordination with us, their communication with us, uh, and guidance through the, through the entire process. Uh, next slide, please. 
In terms of the service view of the budget, we like to look at it not in terms of dollars, but in terms of service view. Um, again, um, nearly three quarters of the budget is all targeted on protection, prevention, and re resiliency, with 27% having to do with capital and professional services. And as I mentioned during the budget presentations earlier in the year, if you really take the staffing and allocate staffing costs to uh, most of our um, uh, endeavors, it's really more in the 90% range that all these dollars go, go towards the core mission, which the commission has set out through its, through its strategic plan. So this is the same um, allocation that you saw uh, several months ago. Uh, it is unchanged and of course it was um, ratified and approved and adopted by the county. Next slide, please. Uh, I just to remind the commission that um, earlier in the year, the county did confirm our base budget, which was $16.3 million. And through this adoption process on June 13th, they approved one-time requests of $1.7 million and ongoing requests of $530,000 coming up with the 18.587988, which you did see in February in the narrative draft and in the draft budget, which was presented to you. Next slide, please. I won't go through all the line item details here, but our ongoing requests included uh, the request for additional FTE funding. It included other ancillary items like uh, FTE support uh, for workers' compensation, liability insurance, and also uh, professional services for HR support needed, needed given that FTE growth as well. In terms of our one-time requests, which was the next, uh, excuse me, uh, I wanted to remind, um, please, next slide, please, Corey. Yeah, in terms of the FTE requests, uh, we have now moved officially from 10 FTEs to 13.5. And the, we had an upgrade of the events coordinator, Firewars coach, to community, community events specialist. The grant specialist was upgraded to IH, IHFR specialist. And this budget reflects the addition of a project specialist, a part-time operations project manager, and an admin analyst as well. So the 13.5 now has been codified and adopted in the, uh, in the budget. Next slide, please. In terms of one-time requests, there's several items here. I won't go through each one of them, but of course, uh, very significant note is the uh, increase in funding for the I-280 project. Uh, and when we presented the I-280 project to the county, we not only discussed the one year, we discussed the, the, the five-year plan there as well. Of course, we can't say that that five-year plan was adopted, but they're aware and they, they were advised of um, the tenure of that particular project as well. It also includes funding for a uh, district-wide EII support EIR um, uh, study, and that was $100,000. And um, exciting news, the, the evaluation of a potential new fire facility for $350,000. There's other, other items on here, but all these items uh, which were in the budget, which the commission did approve and submit to the county, uh, it, again, again passed and were adopted. And next slide, please. Uh, I don't want to forget the importance of all projects and programs. And in fact, the total $4.5 million of all projects and programs, this is a five-year presentation that you're seeing here. Of course, we haven't adopted beyond 24, 25, but it kind of gives you a sense of what our five-year vision is. But everything under the fiscal year 25 column, the green and blue was adopted and some very significant projects there. Again, uh, uh, the defensible space shipping, home exist HIZ program, evacuation routes, um, and all the other projects, including the community outreach um, and um, community education, all these items, uh, again, are a very significant part of our budget. And this is what it, the total amount of the projects and programs, uh, which are in the line items, which you will be adopting this evening, presumably uh, this evening uh, under Exhibit A. The five-year forecast uh, is just informational. Uh, we are developing uh, a five to 10 year forecast, which we'll bring back to this commission in the next month or two or, or three. Um, but this gives you a vision of what our thoughts are as how that might emanate. Next slide, please. So in essence, on the I-280 project, this is what we communicated to the county. Again, we asked for this million dollar allocation, which was $800,000 above the, the prior year allocation. But we also uh, did share this information with the county that 
Next year, uh, the projection is 2.5, the following is 1.5, and the following year is $650,000. Again, uh, it's up to the county to adopt that, but this is the chronology that we listed for them in our request for justification for the current year dollars. And next slide, please. So you have several documents in your packet this evening. Um, you have the budget narrative, which has now been updated for the adopted numbers. Again, the numbers didn't change, but of course the, the narrative changed a bit in terms of dates and the use of the term adoption. You have exhibit A, which is the exhibit which is displayed in the, in the, in the middle. That is the line item budget, which Corey and I do send to OBA and which they put into their systems. And that's what we're asking for adoption this particular evening. The narrative is just subject to approval uh, because that's approval at, at this level. Um, we also this year uh, jumped ahead uh, we gave you a bit of a, a preview of the service area manager budgets uh, earlier in the year. We have now formalized that. It is an exhibit to the narrative. Again, it's not something that's adopted, but that is going to be the workhorse for us in terms of following the dollars by each service area manager. And you'll notice one change from the last presentation is, whereas we presented summary last time, you'll now see actually line items by service area manager as well. And uh, Corey and I are hard at work as we speak, uh, developing the QuickBooks system, which thank you for approving that at the last meeting, uh, and, and our payroll system to accommodate that type of model. And so that is forthcoming in, in, in the new year. And with the next slide. Some very good news that we just found out today at two o'clock. Um, uh, two o'clock today, this is a um, extract from the county's meeting today. So I apologize, it's a little blurry, but I cut and pasted it from their website. And the county did formally approve the roll forward of two significant items from the current year into the next year's budget. Now, that's not part of the $18.5 million number that you will be adopting this evening. But with this approval at the county, sometime in July and August, they will advance this dollar into fiscal year 24, 25, which means the total amount of the budget, most likely we'll see that in July and August, will be 20.975 million. The significance of this is that they rolled forward the um, payment for the fire truck, which was approved, and they all also rolled forward all our capital requests, which have not yet been purchased. In particular, the two vehicles, which we are finding, um, are very hard to come by given supply chain uh, issues, in particular uh, clean air vehicles uh, in, in with Ford in particular and Chevy are really hard to come by, but we're holding the line there. We want those type of vehicles. And so we ask for that um, advancement of the dollars. So we'll get them when, when they come in, but it looks like it may not be until uh, August or September when those fl that fleet will start coming back into Ford and Chevy from the supply chain delays. So with that, I believe um, we are there. Um, and these are the actions that we're asking for this evening uh, for the commission to consider and we're available for any questions. I do, again, uh, want to thank everybody involved. And I wanna thank also the service area managers. Uh, this process of building this budget goes back to the planning sessions. We've had two planning sessions this past year and this budget could not have been created without the discussions and the brainstorming done by the entire team. In essence, you, the, the budget is a reflection of the strategic plan, and it's a reflection of those discussions that took place at the planning sessions. Thank you so much. Any comments? I just, mm -hmm. just wanna say what a wonderful presentation. Very great, thank you. Yeah. Other comments up here? It's very impressive, just the level of completeness and detail that we're, the team is now able to provide and the ability to get it delivered and then navigate through the Byzantine structure, you know, county <laughs> budgeting process. Congratulations. Yes. Uh, any public comments on this item? Um, oh, we have public, time for public comments. Please, please come to the microphone. Uh, yes, yeah, except for, for recording, yes. Too much information on one page. You might want to put a few more pages <laughs> with less information on it. So it's hard to read from in the room. Yeah. I mean, I've got my phone zoomed in so I can actually read what's on the on the screen. There are actually, oh, there are actually some more detailed full print copies, sizes that, that 
are available for you that you can dive into much more detail. So, uh, you know, it would be nice if they put the website on the presentations and that would entice people to go and do their own research because yeah. nothing in here shows where to go. To True, Every, but fortunately we have a great web team. So everything's at lehcfd.org. Well, my first meeting, so. I, and, we're glad, and we're glad to have you there as a, we are really glad to have you here as a voice of the public to see what we, what we need to provide. So this information is here in great detail. These guys do a great job and I'm glad you're well, interested. Great information. I'm actually glad you're interested. I really am. And so we'll make sure we, we point you to where it is. So. Oh, I don't even know what your website is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in that case, there's a more public comment. Uh, move on to items uh, 10B and C. Uh, one thing I'm going to say is I'm, I'm, I fear that what will, what will probably be a fairly mundane uh, motion and voting process really belies the incredible effort this represents. And I'm Corey and Russ and everyone, of course, uh, but not only the set of numbers that are here, but what it shows the effort it took to educate everyone through the county and, and the way the OBA worked with us as well, the effort they put in to understand all these numbers uh, and to find the were credible for us. It just represents a huge amount of effort across this county to allow us to do what we do. So I just thought it deserved recognizing that everyone here is a big part of this. So it's uh, this, this is a wonderful vote to take. Assuming everyone votes for it, we'll find out. Uh, okay, entertain a motion to adopt the fiscal year 25 budget of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and to approve the fiscal year 25 budget narrative. Sherlock moves to adopt the 24-25 budget. Blanco seconds. Great, thank you. Uh, any discussion from the commission? Any public comment? Not seeing any further comment. Great, let's now vote. Take a roll call. All right. President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Okay, and the motion passes six to zero with one absent. All right, now Russ, get started on the next one. Nope. <laughs> it comes up so quickly. It's like no, no peace for the wicked. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, moving on to item 11. We are going to uh, receive an informational report pertaining to the procurement of fire engines and equipment and provide direction to the general manager. This will be General Manager Logan providing us a report. Uh, thank you, Board President Spring, Vice President Sherlock, commissioners, consultants, staff, and the public. Today, we can watch the news, breathe the smoke in the air, speak with fire responders, and hear the many reports of statewide fires and those in nearby states to know that we are entering fire season with an early onset of wildfires and deployment of precious and limited resources. The county executive reported to the Board of Supervisors today noted these wildfire conditions throughout the state that county strike teams were deployed and critical fire was uh, safety were at, at issue with these wildfire events in mind it's particularly timely to present this report for deployment of a proposed for development of a proposed agreement with the fire department for procurement of two fire engines and firefighting equipment this procurement is a proactive and necessary opportunity to strengthen community safety. And with that, Corey, if you can move me to slide one. Um, we are, are recommending and interested for the commission to consider this proactive development to strengthen community safety by funding the procurement of the two fire engines and related firefighting equipment. This will be coordinated with Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District or Central Fire, and the development of the agreement will be between the district and Central Fire. It will be assisted by County Council, fund adjustment coordinated by OBA, and necessary approvals by the Board of Commissioners and or the Board of Supervisors. Next slide, please. So the district's initiatives to respond to wildfire and emergencies and disasters have really developed over the last few years. Uh, the, the programs have deeply penetrated and reduced the threat of loss of life and property that can arise during moments of ignition, such as a vehicle, structure, or brush fire, and critical and catastrophic events. And you'll see there a chart that just depicts the various kinds of programs that we have that address these initiatives for safety. Uh, next slide, please. 
The initiatives also are a contract with with uh, Central Fire for disaster services. There's fire suppression, emergency medical response, hazmat response, mutual aid to the district. Initiatives to strengthen emergency response have originated from the operation of Palo Alto Fire Station 8 during high fire season, extra seasonal fire crews, 24-7 battalion chief services, procurement of a water tender apparatus, and procurement of a fire truck. Next slide, please. So the procurement of two fire engines and firefighting equipment is proactive and anticipating supply chain shortages, which we've talked about now for the last number of months. Fire apparatuses require up to three to four years to build, equip, and deliver. We're ordering to order in anticipation of fleet turnover and replacement schedules allows for timely management of resource needs and capacity. It allows for enhancement of reserve fire apparatus fleet and it solidifies a position in the long line of product production orders. To mitigate inflation cost increases is important because of the rapid increase in costs due to market demands, shortages of parts and inflation. An engine costs approximately 600,000 in recent years, now currently is estimated at a million 100,000. Next slide. So we also need to plan for the increase in population in Los Altos Hills. The increase will impact fire and emergency medical response time in LHCFD, which is, is a uh, wooey terrain. The Los Altos Hills housing element proposes development of senior housing, multiple units, ADUs, and multiple family density. The LAFCO countywide fire review and the Association of Bay Area Governments project a 14% increase in Los Altos Hills property population by 2020, uh, 2035. And then in addition, th these procurements will provide regional benefits and, and uh, assist the mutual aid system by supporting critical mutual aid to residents and neighboring communities. And it's a similar strategy um, for what we did over at uh, Palo Alto Fire Station 8. And next slide, please. So to be developed with Central Fire with um, commission direction would be an agreement between Los Altos Hills and Central Fire. Then the agreement would have the details for reimbursement, purchase, and operation of the fire engines and equipment. There would be a funding allocation and the necessary approvals. And next slide. So to seek commission direction tonight would be that we would return to the commission on July 16th and with a recommendation, proposed agreement, process for funding, and the district team will coordinate with OBA funding adjustment and approvals necessary, either by the Board of Supervisors or the Board of Commissioners. Next slide. So our fiscal impact, we have sufficient funds available fund available balance for procurement of two fire engines and firefighting equipment and the impact on the strategic plan, the apparatus and equipment procurement supports goal one, goal two, goal three, and goal four. So we hit all cylinders on our strategic plan by this, um, by this procurement. And the next slide. Here is a, um, just a um, screenshot of the third infrastructure goal, which if you'll notice, it talks about purchase of district vehicles and purchase of new apparatuses for Santa Clara County Central Fire. And as we put this, this strategic plan together back in 2023, I think we were very visionary in seeing that this day would come. So that's the end of my report. And uh, I'm happy to take comments from the commission and uh, direction as to how you would like us to proceed. Thank you. Can we have some direction, please? Questions. Um, so, um, General Manager, is this the idea is to add two more units to the fleet, or is it these targeted replacements, scheduled replacements for vehicles that are currently in the fleet? And, and if so, what type of apparatus are we looking at? Type 1, Type 3s? Yes. So, we're looking at en uh, engines, and that will be uh, formulated in the details in the agreement 
as to, because it's going to be a three to four year delivery time as to what the, the best thinking from Central Fire and the district is. So I don't, I really can't answer those specifically other than it is designated as um, engines, not trucks or rescues, and it would be part of the Central Fire fleet. <clears throat> sure. Please. I, I just wanted to say, coming from my personal experiences and in my career, um, it's so much, it's better to have and safer to have an extra fire engine or two, uh, because imagine waking up at two in the morning and running a marathon. That's kind of how a fire engine is treated. You know, they get a call in the middle of the night and they're on the stepping, you know, full throttle on the gas. So fire engines, they're well-maintained, but they are abused. They're, you know, they're, they're worked very hard. And I've been in the situation where we've broken down going to a fire and we had no reserve fire engines to back us up. Um, and with the delay in the supply chains, we just, I don't think we can move fast enough acquiring these engines. And um, mm. so I, I wholeheartedly believe that we should be, um, and I support, you know, getting two more fire engines to be in the fleet available. Mm -hmm. um, and also for sometimes for strike teams, when a, like when uh, the station three engine three seventy four is in that strike team bound south, then they need another piece of equipment to replace that. Otherwise, you know you're you're caught without that. So that's just my thoughts. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think I agree. It gets us closer to self resiliency and self support, and also to act as partners to people in our community where we can also you know work with them when they need help. So I think it's a great idea. Just one more quick, thing. please. When when you do have reserve apparatus and there is a large fire, it allows off-duty fire personnel to come in and then staff that equipment to, to to then give you protection to the community that you otherwise wouldn't have that Great. available to you. Thank you. Thank you, and well stated. I appreciate. I agree with you. There, do you have enough direction? I, I I certainly concur. I concur. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. Okay, very good. In just my recent conversations with uh, fire responders, the one thing that seems to be the biggest deficit are the apparatuses, and probably so because they're so expensive. But as, as was alluded to, we can bring the crews back, but then having you know, worthy equipment for them to be in and to have that fleet bulked up to where that's available is really, really going to be important as we're just witnessing wildfires and we know what climate change is doing and we know all the protection and prevention that we're taking and resiliency. This is the area that I think that we can make the, the biggest gains on the quickest and that's the two apparatuses and the firefighting equipment. So thank you for your support very much. We'll come back to you just with one, a good work. Yeah. One more quick, please. Funny note, yes. there was nothing... One of the most embarrassing points of my life was being broken down on a reserve fire engine on Page Mill Road and watching County Fire go by <laughs> and wave and ring the bell to us. Yeah. And, you know, the shame that we felt. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any public comment on this item? Um, yes, we have one comment from Alan Epstein. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say that the existing agreement already covers the responsibility for providing apparatus and equipment. Um, secondly, I don't think the question was answered as to is this equipment replacement equipment or is this equipment additional equipment? And I guess thirdly is um, it seems like the district is now getting into the business of some of the responsibilities of the of Santa Clara County Fire Department. Um, None of these vehicles will be operated by district employees. They will all be operated by Santa Clara County Fire Department. And they have provisions for um, maintaining their vehicles and having reserve vehicles and so forth. So it seems like what's happening now is uh, we're becoming a funding agency uh, for the Santa Clara County Fire Department. So I'd be curious to understand um, why the existing agreement doesn't cover this and uh, is this equipment going to be additional equipment or just replacement for existing equipment? Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll get we'll get some answers to that when we get the details from next month when it comes back to us. So thank you. Uh, moving on to any other public comment? No, I'm seeing none. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 12. Um, this is going to be a report on... Uh, District provided benefits for employees. Strategic planning consultant Scott will be providing us a report. 
Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Marcy Scott with MRG Consulting. And um, I'll just keep talking, um, Corey. I just have a few slides for tonight, and we'll just start with the first slide. Um, so we return tonight with an action item for commission requesting authorization for the general manager to enter into agreements with two vendors to provide a health reimbursement account and to establish deferred compensation accounts for district employees, um, which is defined as staff who receive a W-2 form. Um, uh, district staff have entered into employment here at the district without benefits, and they have obtained their own health coverage through various means. The recommendations tonight provide some relief uh, for the high cost of health care in a manner that is flexible, uh, providing the least disruption to employees' existing coverage and their current providers and uses pre-tax funds to the greatest extent possible. As a result, and upon further discussions with vendors and brokers, uh, we've made a few adjustments to the plan um, as compared to what was presented last month. Uh, so on the current slide, we um, can see that uh, the provision of employee benefits programs meets uh, objective strategic plan four, um, sustainability. And secondly, both um, the current year, fiscal year 23-24 budget and the newly adopted uh, fiscal year 24-25 budget have sufficient funds to cover the costs of setup, administration fees, and district contributions as proposed tonight. So next slide, please. So uh, the components for tonight are a um, a health reimbursement account known as a QSERA, and that is a qualified small employer health reimbursement account. And those are intended for employers with 50 or fewer employees. Um, and then secondly, a deferred compensation plan with a district match of up to 4%. Um, and these are in conjunction with the existing employee assistance program. So next slide. So the QSERA, um, in this, in this uh, tool, district employees will incur costs related to health care for themselves and their dependents. They may submit receipts to a third party administrator who reviews for compliance with IRS regulations and then issues payment to the employees to reimburse them for those costs. Um, the district would not be involved in that process. That would be completely outsourced. Um, and there's a very large list of qualified reimbursable costs, including items such as prescriptions, employee portion of procedures, co-pays, vision costs, such as annual vision exam, frames, contact lenses, dental costs, such as regular cleaning, cavities, and crowns. All of these costs may be reimbursed with pre-tax funds. Um, premium costs are generally reimbursable as well, um, but depending on the type of medical insurance plan, it may be pre or post tax reimbursable. Um, and uh, the IRS um, provides um, the amount that's on the slide as the maximum reimbursable allowed per month. Um, and they have two levels. The 512 amount is for single, and then the 1,037 is for single plus dependents or family. Those are the two levels that they um, provide. So that's what we would also fund. So in other words, the district would fund the appropriate amount for each employee. And again, it's a reimbursement. So those funds are distributed as the costs are incurred under the qualified umbrella of what's under the IRS code. Um, the IRS typically adjusts the maximum reimbursement limit on an annual basis. The district proposes funding to the IRS, ma IRS maximum reimbursement amount with a benefits review at least every three years to ensure the costs align within the district budget. Um, now, in using this particular tool that does provide some nice um, tax benefits, 
um, the trade-off is that the employer is not able to offer any group plans. Um, so last month we talked about offering a group dental and vision, but we can't do all of those things. So this tool provides the most flexibility for employees and um, provides funding to pay um, toward the most expensive cost, which is premium for healthcare. So um, that is how we landed at this recommendation. Um, next slide, please. And so the other element is deferred compensation, which is a fairly standard tool in the private sector. It's known as a 401k or 401a. In the public sector, it's a 457 plan. Um, and this would be provided for voluntary participation. The district would like to incentivize saving for future and retirement years through a district match. We've adjusted slightly the recommended match level. Last month, we recommended a 3%. But um, looking at data, the most frequent um, or the most common category of employer match ranges from between 3 to 5%. Um, and since the district does not offer any other type of retirement savings, such as a pension plan, which is fairly common in the public sector, the recommendation is to match dollar for dollar up to a maximum of 4% of annual salary. This deferred comp plan uh, provides a variety of funds, which is solely up to the employee to decide how to uh, invest their own funds. Um, also, the vendor would provide not only an orientation but financial planning assistance as well. Um, so um, the um, uh, both the finance manager and the general manager have worked really hard with me in helping a large number of meetings with vendors and brokers. Um, even though Russ was busy with the budget, he still uh, was able to assist through this whole process. And also the uh, county council was very helpful. They were very knowledgeable in a lot of these benefit areas. So given all of that, the request tonight is for the commission to do two things. One is to authorize the general manager to contract for and implement a qualified small employer health reimbursement account uh, through a third party administrator and fund the maximum annual IRS contribution amount for individual and family coverage with a review in accordance with benefit analysis at least every three years. And secondly, to authorize the general manager to contract for and implement a 457 deferred comp plan um, with Empower and Alliant and approve a dollar for dollar matching cap up to 4% of an employee's annual gross salary. Uh, and then the next steps um, just in terms of implementation are um, for authorization consideration tonight, and then implementation of the QSERA can happen fairly quickly, probably closer to the 30 days, uh, maybe even sooner. Uh, and then the deferred comp takes about 45 to 60 days. And we do want to maximize the time employees have to use these pre-tax benefits in this calendar year. And our vendors are well aware of that. Um, so with all of that, that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions, comments? I see. I see someone look like, look, you're about to say something, but you don't have to. You always think that, but you know, it's almost true, always true. It's actually. the lean towards, it's the lean towards so, the microphone. It's the body language. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to see what the efforts I can see. It took a lot of, of time. This is a tricky thing in a small organization like this. We haven't offered benefits all this time. I think these sound very practical and reasonable. And, and I think they'll, they'll further our goal of maintaining a long-term stable workforce that uh, is, uh, is taken care of and that we appreciate. And, that, and this is a good way to show them. I agree. I think it's the right and the ethical thing to do. Right. I can't say, say it any better than that. So I totally agree. Thank you. Any uh, public comments on this item? No, I'm not seeing any. Uh, in that case, uh, let's move on. Let's see. Uh, Moving on to item 12B, which is to authorize the general manager to contract for and implement a qualified small employer health reimbursement account through the third, a third party administrator. I will entertain a motion in a second. Warren so moves. Tonka seconds. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? None needed. Any public comments on that motion? None. Seeing none, let's take a roll call. Okay. President Spring? Yes. 
Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Okay, the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Thank you uh, very much. Let's see, moving on to item 12C, which is related to authorize the general manager to contract for and implement a 457 deferred compensation plan with Empower and Alliant. I will entertain a motion and a second for that. Sherlock um, moves that to mm -hmm. approve the general manager to contract for the retirement plan. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> second. Tyson, 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 second. second. Tyson. <laughs> okay. Did you get a second on that, Corey? Well... I heard, I heard that one first. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, He's closer. He's closer. Yep. Great. Any discussion? Any public comment on this? Not seeing any. Let's take a roll call. Okay. President Spring? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. All right. The motion passes six to zero with one absent. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the effort that went into that. I know it's been very tricky and thank you for the for staff for their patience in us providing these things to you so we really appreciate it yes and thank you so much for all of your support this mm -hmm. is a really important benchmark i think for the organization yeah, absolutely moving on to item 13 which is personnel uh we are going to uh, 13a is receiving a, a memorandum report for items 13b to 13e uh from general manager logan uh yes thank you um, President Spreen. So I would just call the commission's attention, if you haven't reviewed it, maybe to do again to look at the memorandum report. It outlines the various positions and the persons who are being recommended for employment tonight. I'm very pleased with the um, quality of candidates that we bring forward for these positions. And I think when you read the memorandum report, it will speak very loudly of that. So with that, let me just go right through the agenda. Items 13B through 13E are to discuss and take possible action to approve the following. 13B is a position description and at will agreement for a full time technical data analyst. And by that way, that position's been on our books for the last two years, hasn't been filled and just really pleased to have the candidate now to fill that. Um, Item 13C, position description and at-will employment agreement for an exempt full-time community events specialist. Item 13D, position description at-will agreement for a part-time temporary project specialist assigned to CERT. And 13E, the third amendment to the part-time temporary project specialist employment agreement. The proposed employment agreements and position descriptions are included in the District Board of Commissioners agenda materials and for these items. Government Code, Government, California Government Code Section 54953C3 requires the Commission to orally report a summary of the proposed compensation before taking final action to adopt that compensation, hereby approving the employment agreements. Key components of the proposed compensation are described in detail in the proposed employment agreements. I will now summarize personnel item 13B, technical data analyst. The proposed at-will full-time employment agreement includes an effective date of July 1st, 2024, and includes the following compensation. Wages sets the rate at $67 an hour. Benefits, the position will receive certain benefits, including vacation accrual of 15 days per year with a maximum accrual of any one time of 120 hours, which is 15 days. Sick leave accrual of one hour earned per 30 hours worked up to maximum accrual of 120 hours. Technology stipend of $120 uh, dollars per pay period. Vehicle stipend of $250 per month a uniform allowance up to $2,000 during the first year of employment for specific items identified in the proposed employment agreement. The proposed agreement does provide holiday pay, but does not, does not provide medical benefits, retirement, or benefits at this time. There is language in there that once the medical benefits and retirement benefits become uh, operative, then that candidate or that, that uh, employee would be eligible for those benefits. And the district provides laptop and supportive equipment necessary for performance of the duties. Thank you. Uh, I would entertain questions or a motion to approve this. Warren moves to um, approve 13B. And we're gonna have a lot of motions and seconds for the next few days, for the next few minutes, folks. So Tonka uh, seconds. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Any public comments? Not seeing any. Let's do a roll call. 
President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. And that motion passes six to zero with one absent. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Edgar Martinez, who is the person that was just hired for the full-time technical data analyst. And Edgar's been working with us now for about uh, nine months uh, in a similar role as a temporary position and has just done an outstanding job. We're very, very fortunate to have him join us. So congratulations, mm -hmm. Edgar. <laughs> yeah. She's on the phone. <laughs> okay, I will now summarize personnel item 13C, community events specialists. The proposed at will full-time exempt, this is an exempt employment agreement, includes the effective date of, Jan of July 1st, uh, 2024, and includes the following compensation. Wages sets the annual compensation at $135,200, which is equivalent to an hourly rate of pay at $65 an hour. Benefits, the position will receive certain benefits, including vacation accrual of 15 days per year, a maximum accrual at any one time of 120 hours, which is 15 days. Sick leave accrual of one hour earned per 30 hours worked up to a minimum maximum accrual of 120 hours. Technology stipend of $120 per pay period. Vehicle stipend of $250. Um, a uniform allowance of up to two thousand uh, during two thousand dollars during the first year of employment for specific items identified in the proposed employment agreement. The proposed employment agreement does provide holiday pay, but does not provide medical benefits, retirement benefits. Again, there is a sentence in the agreement that once those become available, then that position would be available for medical and retirement benefits. The district provides laptop and supporting equipment necessary to perform the duties. And the person who is recommended for that position is Amita Sendevich. And as you might know, Anita comes, uh, Amita comes from us as a long-term volunteer, also has an extensive background in finance and accounting, and will be extremely helpful to us when we get into program-based budgeting. So uh, comes with very many different attributes that she can provide to the district, has worked with us since February in a temporary position. Thank you very much. Uh, I've entertained questions or a motion. I move to approve. Tyson seconds. Thank you. Uh, let's see, any public comments? I'm not seeing any. Let's roll call. Okay, President Spring. Yes. Vice President Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. Right, motion passes six to zero with one absent. And welcome to Amita. Thank you. Yes, Amita, welcome. I will now summarize personnel item 13D, Project Specialist CERT. The proposed at-will part-time temporary employment agreement is effective June 18th, 2024 uh, to December 31st of 2024 and includes the following compensation. Wages set the rate of pay at $30 an hour. Total compensation during the term of this agreement shall not exceed $12,300. Benefits, the position will receive certain benefits, including a sick leave accrual of one hour earned per 30 hours worked up to a maximum accrual of 80 hours. Accrued paid sick leave can be used during beginning on the 90th day of employment with no more than 40 hours used in any one year of employment. The proposed employment agreement does not uh, provide technology. Technology stipend, vehicle stipend, uniform allowance, vacation, holiday pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. And the person uh, recommended for this position is with us tonight, and that's Anthony Tam, mm -hmm. who you might recall was one of the CERT um, leaders that was president, teen CERT leaders, president a couple of, uh, about a month ago. And Anthony, we're really glad to have you back here in this position. And an indication that good things come to teens in the teen CERT program. So welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, I would entertain questions or a motion. Move to approve. Warren, Warren seconds. Thank you. Uh, any public comments on this item? I don't see any. No public comments. Okay, uh, let's roll call. Okay, President Spreen. Yes. Vice President Sherlock. Yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. All right, motion passes six to zero with one absent. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. 
I will now summarize personal item 13E, project specialist. The proposed third amendment to the at-will part-time temporary employment agreement expands the scope of work described in Exhibit B, revises the hours of work, and includes the following compensation. Wages, no change in the rate of pay at $30 an hour. Total compensation during the term of the agreement, which is June 21st of 23 through February 28th of 25, shall not exceed $24,000. Benefits, the position will receive certain benefits, including sick leave accrual, one hour earned per 30 hours worked, up to a maximum accrual of 80 hours. Accrued paid sick leave days can be used the beginning of the ninth, 90th day of employment with no more than 40 hours used in any one year of employment. The proposed employment agreement does not provide technology, stipend, vehicle stipend, uniform allowance, vacation, holiday pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. And like to mention, is Corey Beatty still here? He sends his apologies. He got a migraine and had to leave. Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. Yeah, I saw him back there. Okay. This meeting will do that to you. <laughs> I know. As someone who gets migraine, I totally, I totally relate to it. But having said that, I saw the project that he did at the town picnic. Yes. It surpassed all expectations <laughs> I'd ever had. It was incredible. I don't know if the others <laughs> saw it, but oh my God. He is such if a, a picture is worth a thousand words, that was it. Thank That's you great. for saying that because we were there and just marveled at all the people. And it was just like a magnet that attracted yeah. people over. And then you can have an easy conversation about defensible space. But Corey is just so talented and has, has so many great things. And I hope you read his exhibit B because he's back home from architectural school, now can spend some time with us as Anthony Tam, who's going off to college, now can spend some time with us. And I'm just very, very excited. And look at what we're doing. We're showing the whole spectrum of employment, you know, from, from age and from all the various diversity and inclusion and i'm just very pleased so thank you for your confidence but i guess we need a roll a, a roll call correct? let's see oh yeah so, so what are we, are we have we had the motion yet i uh, moved oh. to approve uh <laughs> let's see 13 e hey second warren, warren seconds great uh let's see any public comment i don't see any let's roll call President Spreen? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. And the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, General Manager. Thank you to all the new staff or, or moving Whatever forward staff. Uh, moving on to item 14A, future agenda items. This is an opportunity for commissioners to provide reports or any future agenda topics. Any comments from the commission? Seeing none. Uh, any public comment on this item? For future agenda. Do not see any. Great. Uh, moving on to 14B. This is the notice that the next regular commission meeting is scheduled for July 16th, 2024, in person and hybrid at the Los Altos Hills Town Hall Chambers. Any comments? Does anyone know if they're not going to be here then? Just to let the clerk know. So, so far, we think we'll all be here. The chance I might not be here, but I'll okay. confirm. Great. Um, let's see. In terms of any public comment on that scheduling? I am not seeing any. Oh, great, thank President you. President Spring, can you remind me, do we do we cancel our August meeting? No. no. Uh, we don't cancel, oh boy, we're it's just work, it's work, work, work all the time. <laughs> okay. We work through the summer, yeah. It's, right. we, yep. Yes. Not in August, no, no, but we usually semi-annual semi reports. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There you go. George has been around long enough that he remembers when we used to cancel the August. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just so much going on, day. can't afford it. So, uh, um, oh, but wait, before going, before we, German, just want to say real quickly, thank the town of Los Altos Hills for letting us use this fine facility. And also, I want to uh, thank Oswaldo Rio, who's in the back, help, or was in the back helping us with video. I mean, people forget that he's actually there helping us this entire time, mm -hmm. and he deserves to be to be thanked. And so, I really wanted to call him out. Um, this concludes the June 18th, 2024 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The meeting is adjourned at 8.56 p.m. Uh, see, uh, Emergency Services Manager BB, please stop the recording. <laughs>